are on you look beautiful now I really can't see you but so glad you guys are here yes I'm so excited um, just about Jesus we started a we just did the introduction so you didn't really miss anything and we had opened up lots of cans of worms about fasting this morning down um, at discipleship class and so I and I'm not just saying this because um, I'm not even teaching the class a guy named Jensen Franklin on TV is but 
I'm, so I'm not just saying this to say it, but um, I'm telling you, if you want to know what will change your life, and it's, it's practical application of the scripture, that's what will change your life. Listen, that's encounters empower you to live out what you know. And so it's important that you get the knowing. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. That's the purpose of encounters. The purpose of encounters isn't just to have an encounter, which it is. It's a huge deal. It changed my life having an encounter. But it empowers you to live the truth. And so we're talking about fasting, which is just um, it's an important thing we, we learn about. And so I invite you to come and, and be a part of that. And so that's just on discipleship class at 930. And um, we moved our worship night. It was supposed to be tonight. And we moved it to I did, June 9th. June 9th. So worship night will be June 9th, and that starts at 6, and so we move that. And so if you come tonight, you're just going to hear me um, tell teenagers they need to repent and serve Jesus. But you're welcome to come to that as well. Um, the 14th and 15th is Brother Blessing is going to be here. That's a Tuesday and Wednesday, and uh, starts at 7. Yeah, that'll be great. And so come here and join that. Obviously, next Sunday is Mother's Day. Woo! Yes, Mother's Day. Bring your bring your moms. Let's celebrate our mothers. Amen. And so, lots of cool stuff going on. You guys ready to worship Jesus? Yeah, let's do it. Would you guys just just put your heart in if you haven't already? Some of us have entered in. If you haven't yet, yeah, just just surrender your heart right now to the Lord Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. We give you first place in our hearts, in our mind right now, Lord. We just thank you for the opportunity to gather together to be with you, to know you. God, I thank you for your presence that's in this place. Jesus, I thank you that you're in this room, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you're here. I thank you that you're here in this room to encounter us, to encounter these people, your people, the sheep of your fold. And so, Jesus, I thank you for encounters right now, Lord. I pray that hard hearts would become soft. I thank you that diseases would be healed. I thank you that lives would be destroyed as we just stand in your presence and acknowledge the king i even just felt like we need to say that jesus just say this with me jesus i acknowledge you just give him give him your acknowledgement he's in this room we're not trying to get him to come into the room he's here so jesus we acknowledge that you're here we worship you we worship you we worship you lord i ask your blessing upon the rest of the service your tithes lord your offerings lord we give it all back to you god to advance your kingdom and destroy hell in the name of jesus god i thank you in jesus name we pray in jesus name Amen. there's a sing in my voice and a stone in my praise pushing back when the darkest weapons form there's a power on my lips, even death can defy, when the name of our God is lifted high. Cause there is resurrection power, when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power, when we raise a mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud, make that empty grave. Resound, there is resurrection power in His name. There are days I have seen filled with heartache and loss that have buried my heart beneath their weight. But every time His praise breaks out, dead things rise up from the ground. I won't leave my song inside that empty grave. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. Come out of that 
mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. In His name. There is resurrection power in His name. There is resurrection power in His name. Oh, dear. Come out of that grave, come out of that grave When we sing, captives, let go of those chains Let go of those chains When we praise dead men Come out of that grave, come out of that grave When we sing, captives, let go of those chains Let go of those chains When we praise dead men Come out of that grave, come out of that grave When we sing Let go of those chains when we praise them. Man, come out of that grave. Come out of that grave when we see captives. Let go of those chains. Let go of those chains. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise mighty sound. Come on, let the praise be loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. There is resurrection power in His name. There is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. Come on, let the praise get loud. Make that empty grave resound. There is resurrection power in His name. I am. I give you my praise. 
most of you guys know that Donnie and I have been, uh, Donnie, you guys know Donnie drives a charter bus, and so he's gone sometimes. And this time they asked me to go with him on this trip to be the tour guide, which was pretty comical. Um, I had this big notebook of stuff that I, I showed some of you guys, and I was pretty stressed out about it. I was real stressed out about it. That I would do the company a good job, that I would do my husband a good job, that I would do the kingdom of God a good job. I wanted to represent all of those things well. And I've been with him a few times and I've done that, but I want to tell you, this song just keeps hitting me. Because we, um, we went to Pella, Iowa. It was called a tulip trip, tulip time trip. And so, just to tell you real, real quick, um, what they do there is they have a big festival and they they recognize and honor their heritage uh, in Pella, Iowa. And it, it goes all the way back to biblical times to Pella, Jordan, where the Christians didn't conform to what was being taught. And so they escaped there and hid there for a while. So when they came to America, they named that city after where they hid out in Jordan. And they came to America because of religious freedoms. But the thing that they did there during this time, they have, you know, like we have homecoming queens and all those kind of things. They had a tulip queen. I shared this with Paula this morning. And they really honored their heritage. And over 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 men after women after men after women who got up and had a part in what was going on. It wasn't a play. It was all an outdoor thing. It was just gorgeous. They talked about God over and over. I've never saw a, an area so full of Christian families, Christian schools. They honored and honored and honored the children. They had a, a huge, the parade was an hour and a half long. It looked like something that I would have watched on TV. I'd never saw anything so elaborate. But they had children, rows and rows, school after school after Christian school, of all these little children. They was all dressed in their little Dutch outfits to remember their heritage, which was about God. The Tulip Queen was her senior year in high school. She didn't come out and sequins and some big fancy skin tight show and everything ball gown yeah we talked about holiness this morning too in class so I'm going to throw that in there she looked like something out of a magazine that was depicting what they looked like years ago in Dutch she had her attendants they were all like that dressed like that basically you didn't even see anything of her body except her face she was a Christian. She came from a Christian high school. She served the Lord. She was on the worship team at her church. She just continued to talk about the Lord. And she was dressed from head to toe, and they talked about the things that she wore. And the things that she wore honored God. I bawled. We were sitting. We were, we were hot. We'd been sitting for hours on a metal bleacher. My back was killing me. I was uncomfortable. And I sat over there and bawled. I thought, well, Lord, they haven't forgot you. Yeah. This group of people hasn't forgot you. Yeah. And they're honoring you over and over and over. This was not a religious event at all. But it was. Because they gave glory to God more than many churches probably to us. 150,000 people were there sitting on the streets of this town. They come from all over the place to watch this. It was amazing. I loved it. I want to go back. I want to go back when I'm not in charge of 49 other people. But I want to tell you, they, from those little bitty tiny kids that were, and they, I'm telling you, they honored the children. They honored life. They honored family. I never saw anything like that. Not that wasn't in a church setting, you know, or, or, or for something like that. Continually, they honored the Lord. Those young ladies that was in, that was the tulip queen. 
and all her attendants, most of their goals in life was to serve the Lord. And they stated that as they were bringing them up and announcing them. Their daddies are the ones that come and, and presented them to the crowd. Their families, and their daddies. It wasn't a, and I'm not mouthing this. My goodness, I was involved in it myself in school. It wasn't a big old burly football guy. It was dad marching you down the aisle and stood by you. And they talked about their families and their families in church. I'm telling you. They didn't forget all these years and they're still, how many years has they been doing this? I don't know. They, uh, I think it was in the 1800s. And in the 1900s, they started doing this festival and they haven't forgot. And I had to repent. Sitting on those hot bleachers and I was uncomfortable. There were people everywhere, you couldn't even move. I don't think anybody else saw me crying or repenting, although I could have got on my knees. I was like, Lord, there's times I forget. The church is forgot. The church is forgot. The Lord's good to us. He's gracious to us, and his mercies are new every single day. Think about that for a minute. His mercies are new every single day. So when we see this song and it says, without caution, those people had no caution. They had no caution. Those little kids had no caution. Those teenage girls had no caution. It was their whole lives were about the Lord and remembering what he had done for them and where they had brought them. just think, I don't want to get uncomfortable for a minute. Church, we need to remember. We need to remember what the Lord has done for you. What he has done for us. What he's done for America. We need to remember. We need to remember. You need to remember. So I... I just want you to, to sing that again, but I want you just to pray for a minute. Play for a minute.
king of love had given up his life the darkest day of history they're on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice he made as the heavens
Sometimes, church, I'm not sure what we're waiting on. Hmm. I'm not sure sometimes what we're waiting on because he's here. Maybe we're waiting on him to show up in a pair of BKE jeans and a champion hoodie and a carrying his computer in a Louis Vuitton leather bag or something. I'm not sure what we're waiting on. He might show up in an old 71 orange Ford pickup without tie rods on the back and it's just going down the road sideways. And he might show up in a pair of dirty khakis or a pair of chicken poop boots or something. He might just show up how you don't expect him to show up. But I'm telling you this morning, he's here. He's here. And he wants to encounter you. He wants you to open your heart enough that he can get inside of there. He's not interested in what you look like or what you smell like. He's interested in being in your heart. He's yes. interested in having an encounter, a relationship with you today. And so I'm not sure what you showed up here thinking you were waiting on. What you were thinking, oh, when this happens, I'll know that he's here. No, listen to me. He's here. He was here waiting on you when you walked through the door. He's in this place. He's waiting on you. And he don't want you to look a certain way or act a certain way. He just wants you to come surrendered. He just wants you to come sold out to whatever he wants to do. Jesus, we're here. We surrender to you today. And we say, have your way in us. Speak to us through your word, Father, that we could come just a little more close to you. Just speak to us today, Father. Help us get our mind, our, our eyes off of what the world offers or, or what we think we should look like or what we think we should act like. Help us just set our gaze on you and follow you. Let us stop waiting. Step into your presence. Father, I love you and I love the way you teach us. I love the way you just show up and tap on the door of our heart and say, hey, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. You're not fancy. You don't have a list of requirements, God. You're just, you just want us. Come on, church, will you join me in just surrendering to him today? Just surrendering your heart to him and saying, have your way in me, God. Have your way in me, God. I want you more than anything. I need you. I long for you. So Father, we love you. We praise you. Again, we ask you to speak to us today. Have your way in us. Make us the men and women you've called us to be. today in Jesus name Amen Amen He's so good He's so good I don't know what you came looking for but he's here He's here I want to rephrase I don't know what you came looking for but I know what you need and the thing that you need is already here He's already here. We don't have to wait on him. We don't have to strive for it. He's already here. And all it takes is just this much surrender. If you'll just start, if you'll just start to step through the door, he'll kick the door open. Mm. So glad you're here today. I feel like I've talked about this subject on and off for the last 15 years. And, um, I, would, I just wish we as a church would get it. If we would, I could move on to something different. But we're just going to talk about us a little bit today, and we're going to talk about God's anointing. We're going to talk about God's anointing. God calls, listen to me, God calls the most unlikely people. I, I'm very much proof of that. I am the most unlikely person to be chosen 
to be a pastor of any, you know, I do have a heart. I mean, I've always had a big heart for people. I love, especially old people. I love people. I love people. I remember when I was a little boy, we lived in Rogers. I don't know, it was eight or nine years old. And our neighbor, she really did. I'm not making fun. I'm not, I'm not just trying to be punny. She really was blue haired. She had blue hair. I mean, her hair was as blue as brother's shirt back here. She had blue hair. And I loved her. her. Her name was Mrs. Carroll. She was our next door neighbor. And I loved her. I would pick every weed out of her yard just because I loved her. I loved her. And um, I, just, I was just drawn to people even when I was a little boy. But I was so backward. I was so shut up in myself and introverted that I could not even talk to somebody. I mean, if I tried to talk to you, most of the time I had my hand over my mouth. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to say something stupid. You couldn't understand half of what I was saying because I was so introverted. And then also on the other spectrum of that, I was so wild that I couldn't be taught in school hardly because I was just trying to fit in. And so I would do stupid stuff all the time. And I was most of the time my desk was sitting right up against the teacher's desk or out in the hallway because I was so in trouble all the time because I was just wild. But it wasn't because I wanted to be wild or wanted attention. It was like I didn't know how to fit in, and so I just over the top. But I was so introverted. Even when Laura and I got married, I remember. I mean, you all have heard this probably, heard me talk about this before, but she would want to go to go to the store, and I would think, oh, I do not want to go to Walmart. We're going to see somebody that I know, and it's not that I didn't like them. It's that I thought I'd say something stupid, so I didn't want to see anybody I know. I mean, I'd see somebody down the aisle and say, oh, I know them. I'm going down this aisle. I was just so introverted. And God says, I want you to pastor a church. I'm like, what? You want me to do what? I can't talk in front of people. I remember when God called us, the first thing in ministry that I did really, that my first role in ministry at all was mowing the yard at the First Baptist Church in Pew Ridge. And I loved it. I loved serving. And um, man... I don't know, some of the other guys that was on that crew would probably want the same bragging rights, but when I got done mowing, that place was immaculate. I'd spend all day, that wasn't a very big yard, I'd spend all day, every uh, on my turn, all day on Saturday, making sure it was the best that it could be for Sunday. I loved doing it, I loved just serving that way. I didn't have to talk to nobody. But God called me and Laura to be, you know, we started working with youth. And um, we had no intentions of being youth pastors, but we started working with a, a man and woman who were the youth pastors. And we were just drawn to teenagers because we had been so such wild teenagers that we didn't want them to do what we had done. And so we wanted to tell them before they got to that point and say, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do those things. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to fit in. And so we started, you know, we'd go to the hayride and we'd go to the bonfires and we'd do whatever just to serve. And that couple moved to Colorado. They were some good friends of ours and we all loved Colorado. And that couple moved to Colorado. And when they did, the board came and asked Laura and I to be the youth pastors. I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot do that. No, I can cook a hot dog. But I can't do that. And so we got these little books, you know, I, I'm not trying to stereotype or compare but the Baptist church is a little different than the Pentecostal church and so youth services looked a little different I mean we'd sit around on couches and we had a cool youth room but I felt mostly that we were, baby, we were babysitting teenagers I mean that's what it felt like we were just keeping them out of their parents hair while they had their Bible studies and we were having our own little Bible study and so it wasn't like we were having church it wasn't like I had to get up and preach I just had to bring some kind of a lesson, and Laura did it 95% of the time. I worked nights, and, and I would use that as, as an excuse, and I'd throw it off on her, and she had to do it. And so I'd show up at our little things, and I'd serve the hot dogs or the nachos, and then I would sit there on the couch and listen to Laura present a little message, a little uh, Bible study. And we'd order books from different book companies and whatever, and we'd just go through these little studies, you know. And so I'd... She'd say, okay, it's been like 10 since you've done one. It's your turn. 
And I remember sitting on the couch, and I'm not lying. You'll think that I'm making this up. I, I, am promise, you, I promise you I would not look at a kid. I would just go through the stuff. I'd, I'd be turned. They'd be over here. I'd have my stuff over here, and I'd just look through the stuff. We'd talk through I'd get through it, but I have no idea if they got anything out of it. I was so introverted. I was so backward. And then I, I don't know why I'm saying all this. It's not in my notes at all. But then we met this couple, and I just remember he was the, they were the youth pastors at the Pentecostal church, and we were at the Baptist church. And so he had came and asked, hey, would you guys like to start getting together and doing some stuff? We'd like to do some stuff at the park or whatever, just get our groups together, and let's, you know, let's just try to form a community. And um, every time I'd see him, he'd just be smiling and happy, and I'd think, how do you do that? I'm working with teenagers. How are you so happy and full of joy? I want some of that. I want to be like that guy. And so he kind of became my hero. And I was like, I've got to figure out what he's doing. I've got to find out how he's doing this and how he's so full of joy. And um, so we did start doing some things together. Anyway, wasn't long after that. Uh, that was Charles Cutworth, by the way. And wasn't long after that, um, the Lord started doing some things in Lorna's life that wouldn't have been accepted at our church. We had commitments there, and so for maybe nine months, we stayed and just, we were teaching a college-age class by then, and um, we were committed, and so we stayed and done that because of what God had called us to do, not because of our preference, but because of what God called us to do. We were committed and we were saying, I'm, you know, I, I feel the Lord leading me somewhere else, but I'm going to fulfill this commitment. And so we done it right. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but we done it right. We stayed. And um, we finished our obligations. And we talked to our pastor. And we said, you know, we feel like God's doing some things that probably wouldn't be accepted here. I mean, I've got filled with the Spirit. I'm speaking in tongues. And I know y'all don't do that here. And so I think you probably would rather me go down the road. And um, he said, mm, probably. We love you, but prob that was probably fits better down there. And so we went down there. And um, we were youth pastors there for a while. And um, the Lord began to develop me through serving. Um, I was my pastor's, if you want to put a title, and I'm not too hung up on titles, but, we, you know, the church goes through phases where you have... Everybody has to have a title, and then there is none. And then everybody has to have a title, and then there is none. And in that time that I was going through, we were going through this time where everybody had to have a title. I mean, you were, you were the whatever. I mean, if you, if you were the janitor, you were not called the janitor. You were called something ministry, something, something. But I was titled as an armor bearer. And I'd read all the books on armor bearer, and you can find them, and they're good books. Terry Nance writes an awesome book on armor bearer. Everybody in the world should read that book because we're all servants. And um, so I was the armor bearer to our pastor, and I took care of him. I mean, I'd wipe the white stuff out of his mouth when he was preaching if he got any there. I made sure he didn't have any boogers in his nose. I mean, I was that close to him. And um, I took care of his kids and sometimes abandoned my own to go take care of him. And, um, but out of that, God used it. God used me serving. Whew, I'm emotional about it because... God showed up in the midst of that and tapped on the door of my heart and said, Donnie, I want you to pastor a church. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I can do that, God. I was wrestling with it. But I knew God was calling me to it. And so I'm just telling you I was the most unlikely person to be a pastor. I was the most unlikely person. There was many, many people who had the goods that could have. I couldn't preach. I couldn't speak in front of somebody. I could love you. And really, when I think about it, just off the cuff right here, I guess pastoring is just loving people. Pastoring is a shepherd. That's what the, that's what the word means. It's been a shepherd. It's, it's the call that God had on my life. But I had to surrender to it, folks. I had to. 
I, I had to surrender to it. For this to happen, for me to be here this morning, 15 years later, I had to make a surrender. I had to give up what I wanted and say, okay, God, I hear you. I'll do it. I'm sick to death. Listen to me. I'm not on you. I'm not trying to get on you, but I'm sick to death of week after week, after month, after year, after year, after year of coming to this place and some of you still sitting in your seat and I know that God has a call on your life and you're still sitting there. What are you waiting on? It just got real. But I remember that little, I wasn't a little boy 15 years ago in the natural, but in my spirit I was still a little boy. And I remember that little boy driving a bus in the middle of Chicago, dropping a group off and sitting in a hotel for a week by myself and God calling me during that time and thinking, God, I can't. And he said, I know you can't, but I can. And having to come home, I wouldn't tell anyone because I was so scared of that call. I was so afraid to tell anyone because then you're committed. You're like, okay, now I've let it out. Now I have to obey God because I told them. And they're going to hold me accountable. So I wouldn't tell anyone, but I, I was scared to death to tell anyone. So I came home and I said, Laura, I don't know what in the world, but will you pray with me about this? She said, what? No, I'm not even praying about that. That is crazy. No, we are not doing that. I was like, well, that went somewhere. That's what I think too. But a couple of days went by and she come back and she said, I have been praying and I feel like God's doing something. And so we rented this building down the road and here we are. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. I hope you all are in a hurry. But I want you to know I'm not just telling you that to puff myself up. I'm telling you that to tell you that I'm a regular guy and she's a regular gal and we just walk through life just like you do, but God had a call on our life and we had to say yes to it. And some of you in this room, let me back up, sorry, and all of you in this room have a call of God on your life and you are going to have to say yes. You're going to have to say yes to it. Don't you want God to fulfill His will and purpose for Jack and America? I mean, don't you want that? It includes you. And a whole bunch of empty seats of people that should be here to hear this message this morning, it includes them. It's not about your preference. You know, when Laura said, when she was talking this morning about it's pretty humbling to go on a bus trip and see a bunch of people, I mean, people that didn't sign up as a Christian trip. It, it was not a Christian trip. It was just a bus trip. And um, we show up in this town. I thought we were going to look at tulips. I was like, what's a tulip festival? I mean, I've been to the Cherry Blossom Festival. I've been to the Blue Bonnet Festival in Texas. I've been, I mean, I've been everywhere, man. I've been to those festivals. They have festivals around anything because old people like to travel. And if you can give them an excuse to go, they'll go. They're bored. They want community. They want family. And so they get on the bus and they go. So I didn't think anything really about it. I mean, I thought, oh, Tulip Festival, okay, four-day trip, sounds good to me. We'll be home in a minute. Let's go. And Lord gets to be my guide, even a bonus. That's awesome. Let's do it. And so we go on this trip, and when I get there, the culture, and when she's talking about that, it, it's pretty ironic to me that a community of people can, can present their culture and heritage, the gospel, to 150,000 people, but the church can't. And so when she's talking about that and she's saying, you know, why don't you surrender here today? Why don't you remember what he's done for you? Why don't everybody get on your knees and how uncomfortable that is for some of us to do? How I don't mean physically, I mean how uncomfortable spiritually it is to just surrender sometimes to God. But you know what? She didn't ask you. It wasn't about you. She wouldn't ask you to do that about your preference. She was asking you to do, that, to do that for him. And so the same. 
when God has a call on your life, it's not about you. He'll bless you out of it. I promise he will. I mean, there's nothing in the world that I would rather do than be here on this platform right now with this microphone talking to you. I love this place more than any place in the world. I love it. Because God put that passion inside of me when he put the call. When I surrendered, this thing rose up in me, and there's no place I'd rather be. So he'll bless you out of it, but it's not about you. Hmm. I better get on with the notes or we're going to be here a while. He sees beyond external appearances, and he focuses on our heart. God chooses unlikely people to accomplish His purpose so that His power can be made manifest in our weaknesses. So, good morning, River of Faith Church. Thomas, I'm going to switch mics. I almost forgot. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm excited to, to dive into the Word of God with you today. We're, we're going to see how our Heavenly Father looks beyond our package or our packaging and chooses the most unlikely people to manifest His power. Because I think you all think, or I think 90% of the people in church even think, I'm not good enough. I don't look the part. I don't act the part. That he wants to choose unlikely people despite our weaknesses. We're going to see the anointing and calling of David as king. It's a perfect example of what I'm talking about today. It's perfect. Despite his humble background and appearance, turn with me and look at 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 1. First Samuel 16 verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him, from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. How many of you know if God calls you to do something, he always provides a way? You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Hmm. Don't miss that line. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord anointed, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see a man as, uh, the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, stay with me, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab. And made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. 
Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Hmm. Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for I, will sit da- I won't sit down, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose. And went back to Ramah. Now I want to mention here. You probably won't get chosen as king. If you're hanging around the house. David was out tending sheep. The others were just there. Looking good. They didn't smell like an old goat. Sheep. They were put together, hanging out at the house with Daddy. We come out, drive up on this hill. We come in, sit in these chairs, comfy cush, air-conditioned, heated. But are we serving? They didn't get chosen. dive into this powerful story before I get in trouble of how God calls the most unlikely people. Looking beyond the packaging and manifesting his power, listen to me, he manifests his power in our weaknesses. So first thing I want to talk about is looking beyond the package. God told Samuel to go and anoint one of Jesse's sons. God looks beyond the packaging. The world may judge us based on our appearance. Those around us may be interested in our background. Some may be stirred by our qualifications. But God sees our heart and knows our true potential. It's a crucial lesson for us to learn. It can help us recognize the value and potential in our own lives and others' lives. Even when it may not be immediately apparent. I mean, you know, sometimes things aren't as they look. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad about that? When Samuel arrived at Jesse's house, he was presented with Jesse's sons, who were all impressive in their own ways. Samuel, like many of us, was initially drawn to the eldest son, Eliab, who had the appearance of a strong and capable leader. However, God quickly corrected Samuel's thoughts and his perspective. God reminded him that he doesn't look at the outward appearance, but at the heart. God's ways are not our ways. His criteria for choosing those he will use are often used very different from ours. None of Jesse's sons who were presented were chosen. Instead, it was the youngest son, David. The one out tending sheep who was anointed as the king of Israel. David was not the obvious choice. He wasn't even brought in to be selected. He wasn't the obvious choice. But God saw something in him that made him the perfect candidate for the role. God isn't limited by our human expectations or assumptions. He can use the most unlikely people to accomplish, remember, it's His purpose. The truth doesn't just apply to David's story, but it's evident throughout the Bible over and over and in the lives of many believers here today. We often see God choosing the weak. The broken. We see him calling the outcast and we see him demonstrate his power and love through them. And in that he shows that his strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. Hmm. 
There's never a time that I could ever stand. I mean, I could say it. But the truth would reveal that there's never a time that I could stand here and say, look what I done. No, he chose me because he knew that I could stand and he would have to say, look what I've done. He receives the glory for what's accomplished through us. As we apply this truth to our lives, we learn to look beyond the packaging in ourselves and others. We must resist judging ourselves or others based on external factors. Appearance doesn't matter. Are you hearing me? Appearance doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if they got ring noses and, and I, you know, them big earlobe thing dish in their earlobe. It, it wouldn't matter. Appearance doesn't matter. Yeah, gauges, that's what it is, yes. It doesn't matter. Appearance doesn't matter. Tattoos don't matter. But, listen to me, a guy in a suit doesn't matter either. It doesn't matter. There's no, God's not honed in on what we look like. He's honed in on our heart. Maybe they'd have gauges and an ear, nose, and a, and a suit and tie. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there. Backgrounds are irrelevant. Backgrounds are irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you used to be, who you think you used to be. Doesn't matter. I mean, you could have been the highest executive at Walmart. Doesn't matter. You could be the scum of the earth, low life, homeless sucker that was selling dope on the street three weeks ago. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Qualifications become real small because, really, truly, none of us are qualified. The only way we're qualified is through Him. He qualifies us. The Holy Ghost in us is our qualification. I'm proud of a couple of little pieces of paper that I have down there in my office somewhere. I'm proud of them. I worked hard for them. But they don't qualify me. He qualifies me. Instead, we should strive to see others and ourselves that's the hard part. We can see others, but can you see yourself as God sees you? Hmm. You must recognize the potential within each of us and the unique ways in which God can use us for His purposes. This perspective can be so freeing. It allows us to let go of the pressure to conform to the world's standards and expectations. We don't have to look the part. We don't have to be what the world says we have to be. You don't have to, uh, Jesus, help me. I'm going to go on. I'm not saying it. Instead, we can focus on developing our relationship with God and seeing His will for our lives. Stop worrying about what you look like or if you fit in or if you, you look the part. It doesn't matter. If you are the part, He'll, he'll tell you you're the part. Hmm. As we do, We'll see potential in ourselves and others. Even if their packaging may not be what the world consider, considers impressive. We've got to let go of pride and self-sufficiency. Hmm. We must recognize that it's not our own strength. It's not intelligence or abilities, thank you Jesus, that qualifies us for what God has called us to do. Instead, it's His grace and His power working in and through us that enables us to accomplish His purpose. As we humble ourselves before Him, we make room for His Spirit to work in our lives to transform us into people that He's called us to be. Aren't you glad? Well, Joseph is. Aren't you glad? Number two, God calls the most unlikely people. 
This truth is evident throughout the Bible. We, we see God chose people by human standards uh, wouldn't be considered the best candidates for the task at hand. Remember Moses stuttered. Yet, God's wisdom and sovereignty are displayed as he uses them to accomplish his divine purposes. In the story of David's anointing, we see that principle at work. Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel, and Jesse's sons were presented. It became clear that the Lord's choice isn't based on appearance or human qualifications. Again, God looks at our heart. He chooses the youngest and seemingly least qualified of Jesse's sons, David, who was tending sheep. That choice was probably even surprising to those around him. But it's a powerful reminder that God's ways are not our ways. He sees beyond the surface. He knows the potential within each person. David, the shepherd boy, would go on to become one of the greatest kings of Israel's history. A man after God's, God's own heart. His life was marked by triumphs and failures. But through it all, God's anointing and presence were evident. You know, David's story isn't isolated. I mean, his story may be your story. Moses, slow of speech and tongue, yet was chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Gideon, who was the least of his family from the weakest clan in his tribe, yet he was chosen to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Let's not forget Rahab, the prostitute, who played a critical role in the Israelites' acquisition of the Promised Land. These examples and countless examples demonstrate that God's uh, not limited by human expectations or qualifications. He delights in using the weak, the broken, the overlooked to display His power and glory. Now, now listen, eh, never mind, I'm not going to do it. First, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm about to get myself in trouble up here. I'm trying to be good. I love y'all. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Y'all okay? But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. The truth should bring us encouragement, should bring us hope. We may feel inadequate or unqualified to be used by God, but He sees beyond our weakness and our limitations. He knows your heart. He desires to work through us for His glory. When we feel weak, we know that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Hmm. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad? Don't you take hope in that scripture knowing that when you feel weak or inadequate, that's the best time for God to show up. I feel that way 90% of the time that I'm sitting there where Shaylee is or standing there during worship and it's about my turn to come to this pulpit. I, I feel that way. I think, oh God, you are going to have to help me today. I need you. I've got to have you. You have to speak through me. I can't do this. I, I, sometimes I just, if I really think about it, I want to break and run out the back door. Hmm. Then I get up here and become a smart aleck. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
I've been hanging around Josh too long. That's right. <laughs> Hallelujah for Josh. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. As we look at this story of David and other biblical examples, we must ask ourselves a question. Are we willing to be used by God despite our weaknesses? That's not just a question for the preacher. I'm asking you to ask yourself the question. Are we willing to be used by God despite our weaknesses? And then question number two, are we open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Because if you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, listen to me. He'll do some things that you can't ask or even think. Allowing Him to empower and equip us for the task that He called us to do. Now I will say, I'm not the shepherd of this house. I'm the under-shepherd. Okay? I want to clarify, I'm not trying to be religious. I'm just telling you who the boss is around here. The boss is the Holy Ghost. He's the shepherd of this house. But I want to tell you something that I heard Bishop Tony Miller say, and you'll think I'm being cocky by saying this, and I don't mean it that way at all. But I have a call in my life as the under-shepherd of this house. So the ranking, of, the ranking of order around here is the Holy Ghost and then Pastor Donnie. And it's not because the Donnie part, it's because the role of pastor. So it wouldn't matter if it's behind this desk at this moment, Pastor Laura behind this desk at this moment, Pastor Charles are behind this desk at this moment, Pastor Josh, whoever's behind this desk bringing that word, they're the under shepherd at that moment. They're in charge. And so there's sometimes that God says stuff through me that I necessarily, when I'm standing down there, might not say to you. But when I'm up here, I get this spirit on me and I think, okay, I've got to tell them. It's up to me to tell them. If, if I don't, who will? So don't get offended at me. I'm just doing what the Holy Ghost tells me. So if you got qualms, take it up with him. <laughs> and if you don't believe I'm that guy, I'll just take it a step further. If you don't believe I'm that guy, if you don't trust me to be that guy, go somewhere else to church where you do trust them. And I'm not saying that cocky. I'm just saying, if you can't trust what your pastor tells you comes from the Lord, you don't need to be there. You need to be somewhere where you do have that relationship. That's, that's my job here. I, I'm supposed to be a shepherd. I'm supposed to dump the feed out so you can come eat. I'm supposed to help you get to the green pasture so you can graze. But I can't chomp your mouth. You have to do it. You have to say yes. It's him. It's him. I don't know where that came from, but praise God. I'm going to move on to number three. Number three. The third thing we must manifest God's power in our weakness. David wasn't the most obvious choice for the king in the eyes of the world. As the youngest of his brothers, a shepherd boy, and not considered as important as his older siblings, yet God chose him because of his heart and willingness to be used by the Lord. One of the ways we can manifest God's power in our weakness is by embracing the gifts of the Spirit. Now listen to me, the gifts of the Spirit. Y'all read about them, the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians. You know what the gifts of the Spirit are. You've been around here long enough to know there's some gifts that are still on the table. You haven't opened those gifts in your life yet, and it's time to get the gifts of the Spirit, throw the wrapping off of it, and partake. Thank you, Lord. Spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. It enables us to be the body of Christ. Hmm. 
to further the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11, But the manifestation of the Spirit of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Let me read that again. I don't think you got it. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So again, I'll say it's not even just for you. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It's his will. These gifts of the Spirit aren't given based on our merits or abilities. Doesn't matter what you drove up here in. Doesn't matter what you got on your feet today. Doesn't matter how you're dressed. Doesn't matter what you've got in your purse. It doesn't matter. It's not according to your merit or abilities. It's rather as a demonstration of God's power working through us. It's a demonstration. Somebody say demonstration. When you are fulfilling the call of God on your life, you are demonstrating the kingdom of God. You're being a demonstration of Him. When we operate in these gifts, we tap into the spiritual power of God and allow Him to work through our weaknesses to accomplish His purpose. You all know He has a purpose, right? Another way we manifest God's power in weakness is by engaging in spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us that we are in a constant battle against the enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. In John 10, 10, it tells us that. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in heavenly places. You are in a battle. We're called to engage in this spiritual battle. Not in our own strength. But in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on. If you engage that battle in your own strength. You're going to get your tail whipped. You're going to be laid up here on the altar. Saying I don't know what's happening to preacher. I just not here. That's what's going to happen. You can't do it in your own strength. He's given you the spirit. To put on. Hmm. We recognize our own weakness and rely on God's strength. We can overcome the enemy and break strongholds in our lives and the lives of others. Additionally, we can manifest God's power by participating in an outpouring of the Spirit. My gosh, why would we, why would we be scared of the Spirit? That's just a lie from the enemy. I don't know about that blonde-headed woman up there. My gosh, she's kind of crazy. Why would you be scared of that? A, a manifestation of the Spirit. He only wants good for you. Huh. Just get up here and join her. Just dance. It's okay. Hallelujah, I said it. There have been times when God has poured out His Spirit in a powerful way, leading to revival and spiritual awakening. Come on, I've never seen God move that He didn't ask me to move first. I've never had God move in my life that He didn't ask me to move first, and it was never comfortable. It may have been something tiny, little bitty to somebody else, but I can stand there planted, and He's, he's saying, get down on your knees. And when I do, whoop, He moves, because I was obedient. It's like that every time. He might say, Donnie, run around the church three times. And I'm sitting there saying, oh my gosh, they're on to think I'm crazy. Why would I run around the church? Go, just run around the church three times. And so I run around the church three times and something happens. He told Laura a little while back, go open that door. Just go open the door. 
Do y'all remember that service? Just go open the door. She said, I have no idea why he told me to do that, except I know he told me to go do it, so I'm going to go open the door. So she did. And people run out the door like Pentecostal folks. I mean, they're going out here, going around, coming back in that door. Some of them made two or three loops, I think. I'm like, what's happening? But, but God. And he begins to move and show up in our lives in the midst of us just being obedient to him. Listen to me. I, I know that I'm being redundant today and talking about the same thing over and over and over. But if you just get it, I can shut up. You have to get it. You're going to have to say yes to the call of God on your life. I need you to say yes to the call of God. I want this thing. Not because I want to make a name for River of Faith Church. I want to make a name for the kingdom of God. And I want this thing to go beyond where we are. He's called us to do more. He's calling us to affect more. To reach more. To love more. He's calling us to do something else besides you coming here for a little show on Sundays. That's not why we're here. He's waiting, I'm waiting, some of us are waiting on you to say yes. Listen to me, I know everybody's not called to sing. I know everybody's not called to work with kids. I know everybody's not called to do outreach, but you're called to do something. And it may not be what you necessarily desire to do. It's like, I have no idea, God, there's no way. There's no way you could use me to preach. I have no, I have no abilities to do that. I am so. I, I had all the excuses. And he just kept saying, "Oh yeah, I know. Oh yeah, I know you can't, but I can. Oh, oh yeah, I know. I know. Well, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I just want you to do it. I just want you to say yes. I, I'm just waiting on your yes so I can begin to move. Don't think I don't know." Those feelings and those thoughts thinking, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. I'm not qualified, I don't know, I'm, I say something stupid all the time, I, I am not smart, I can't. He's like, I know, but I can. And it's because I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you today, you're sitting in this room because I said yes. And he's waiting on you to say yes. So if he's calling you to work with kids... Get up and get back there. If he's calling you to sing, come talk to Shaylee and get up here. If he's calling you to do outreach, come talk to me. We got plenty to do. There's plenty to do in the kingdom. But he's waiting on you to say yes to whatever it is. If he's calling you to mow some old woman's yard and go pick the weeds out of it, say yes. Oh. He's got a plan. And it's beyond what we think. As we go forth today, I want us to embrace spiritual gifts that the Holy Ghost has given us. As if you try to do it on your own, you will fall flat. You're going to end up with skinned knees and a hurt heart. I want us to open our minds, our hearts to the outpouring of God's love. Because when you, I already mentioned, but I want to tell you it's the truth. If you'll touch your toe in the water, he'll begin to pour it out. He's not going to equip you until he sees you're willing to use it. But when you're willing and you say, okay, God, I can't, but I know you can. Here I am. He's going to begin to pour it out on you. And he, he's going to call you and do things in you that you never asked or even imagined. All because you say yes. I want to be an instrument of the last day revival. I want this church to be an instrument of the last day revival. We're on the brink of that. The world as we know it is on the brink of experiencing a revival that we've never seen before. And I want us to be a part of it. I want us to be a conduit for that to flow through. But it's not going to happen with you sitting in your seats. Hmm. I want to be used to bring God's heart to people. So I want us today... By the Spirit to break down some strongholds. Break down some strongholds. 
that the enemy has tied us up, bound us up, shackled us up in. I want us to break those strongholds today and begin to see breakthrough in the kingdom of God. So I don't know what he's calling you to do, but you know. You already know. There's no doubt in my mind. You already have a clue. There's nobody here clueless. You have a clue of what the Spirit is doing in your life. If you don't, dear Jesus, get in your word and ask him. But some of you know very well. You're hearing God knock on the door of your heart and you have for a while and you haven't responded because you're shackled up. You're chained up. The enemy's got you right where he wants to keep you. There's no way that God would give me a message like this today and get us to this point in this service and not break those chains. So your first big, bold step to say yes is I want you to stand up if that's you. I want you to stand up where you're at and say, yes, I have a call of God on my life and I have not responded yet. I'm not responding to it yet. I haven't responded to it yet. I haven't stepped into what God's calling me to do yet. Come on, there's people standing all over the room. If that's you, stand up and say, yes, that's me. I know God's dealing with me to do something and I haven't stepped into it yet. And I know as you stood, you, you just stuck your toe in the water. And you're saying, here I am, God. I feel you calling me. I, I feel the call on my life. And I'm going to step toward it today. And in that, he's meeting you there. And those chains, I, I hear chains falling. I can't sing, sorry. But chains are falling off your life. Because you're saying yes. Not because I preached a word. Not because you're so big and bad and, and got it all figured out. And you said, okay, the preacher said, stand up. I'm going to stand up. No, because you're surrendering to him and saying yes to him. He's saying, baby, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm waiting on this moment with you. Would you all join me at the front of the room if you're standing? Just come on. Just come on. Just come on. Don't wait. Don't wait. Some of the rest of you need to join them. Some of the rest of them, uh, rest of you need to stand up and join them. And stop letting the enemy hold you there where you're at. He has a purpose for your life or the kingdom. Do you know that from this moment on, your life can be different? You're not going to have all the answers to what God's called you to do. You're not. You're not going to have all the, all the abilities to do what God calls you to do. You're not. But just by you saying yes, just by you saying, here I am, God, I surrender. That's him seeing your heart. He's seeing your heart in that. He sees your heart, which is what he's interested in. He's not interested in any other thing except your heart. So he's saying, give me your heart, I'll do the rest. Mm. So proud of you guys. That's awesome that you stepped out today saying, I realize there's a call on my life and I'm going to step toward it. Young lady, he's going to use you in a mighty, mighty, mighty way. He's going to use you in a mighty way. Everything that he's placed inside of you, those are desires placed there by him for his purpose. Thank you for surrendering. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying yes. Every one of you, thank you for saying yes. Church, would you stretch your hands this way? God, I thank you right now for the call of God on each one that's standing in the front of this room today. I thank you for the call on their life, Father. I thank you, Father, that you're using them. You have a plan, a purpose to use them to advance your kingdom. And God, I thank you for equipping them today. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for by your Spirit, by your Spirit, you're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. We rest in the fact that you're in control. We surrender to you today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate that. He is so good. He's so good. Now listen, the second step, those that came to the front, the second step in that is I want you to find one of us who is on staff here, a leader here, a pastor here. I want you to find one of us and say, this is what God's calling me to do. Let us help you get plugged into the kingdom. Let us help you get plugged into what God wants to use in your life. All right? Deal? All right. Father, I thank you. I love you and I praise you for your word. I thank you, Father, for speaking to us today. Father, I thank you for these men and women who surrendered to your call on their life today. And Father, that you would use them in a mighty way to make a difference in those around them. We give you praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you back on Wednesday night.